the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So we'll continue with um, the story of Moses. We, uh, we, we learned the beginning of the story last week, how Moses uh, grew in the palace and um, how he f- fled the palace because um, he tried to take matters in his own hands and he killed an Egyptian and this was known, so he, he fled. He lived 40 years in the palace in Egypt. And then when he fled, he, he lived 40 years in the wilderness as a shepherd until he saw the burning bush. And at the burning bush, the Lord um, commissioned him to go to Pharaoh and uh, release the Israelites from captivity. He went to Pharaoh 10 times each time. Pharaoh would say no. And then there would be a plague upon the land of Egypt. So 10 plagues in total. The last plague was the the slaughter of the firstborn. And in order for the Israelites to uh, be protected against this plague, they had to sacrifice an animal and and do the rite of the Passover. And we talked about how the Passover, of course, was a very clear symbol of the... um, the the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to save us all. So after the Passover and after this um, event of uh, the the killing of the firstborn, uh, Pharaoh actually basically kicked the Israelites out. Um, So they they left Egypt. And then after this happened, Pharaoh changed his mind and he wanted to go back and to either kill them or bring them back to Egypt uh, as slaves. And really it was more to kill them. Um, And and so the people were scared. They were in front of the Red Sea. Moses prayed to God. God um, opened the Red Sea for them. They fled through the Red Sea. And then when the Egyptians tried to follow them, Moses hit the, the, um, the, the water again, and then the Red Sea collapsed and killed all of the Egyptians. And then they went on their way. Um, until they reached Mount Sinai. This is the mountain where where Moses saw the burning bush. And so he went up on the mountain uh, in in order to pray and to speak to God. And as you see in the picture here, the mountain, it was basically like a volcano, right? There was thundering, there was lightning, um, there was um, shaking and noises. Uh, to the point that the Israelites were afraid even to come close to the mountain. And the, this picture is nice. It shows that the entire camp is back away from the mountain. Um, and only Moses was able to go up on the mountain. And his disciple Joshua went with him halfway. And then he remained there waiting for um, his, his teacher to, to go speak to God and come back. All of this happened, of course, because God descended upon the mountain. And when God descended upon the mountain, the mountain shook. And this actually was one of the symbols of the incarnation in the Old Testament. So Moses remained on the mountain for 40 days, and he received the Ten Commandments. Um, God wrote the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone, and he gave them to Moses. When Moses delayed in the mountain for 40 days, the people thought maybe he died. And so what are we going to do now? Moses is our leader and our leader is dead. So what can we do? Maybe we should go back to Egypt. And so in this process, they said, well, we need a God to go before us. And so they, they, they fashioned a golden calf. They, they compelled Aaron, the brother of Moses, to fashion a golden calf, like we see here in the picture. And they started to worship this golden calf and say, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Very uh, faithless people that God had just showed them um, his power by splitting the Red Sea in front of them, by killing the, all the um, firstborns of Egypt, by all the plagues that they saw. And yet, just because Moses delayed for 40 days, they turned on God and they forgot everything um, that, um, that had happened. So Moses comes down <clears throat> from the mountain and he finds the people are worshiping idols and dancing and, and singing and doing all kinds of unacceptable um, acts. And so he 
is horrified and he takes the two tablets that that had the commandments and he throws them down um <clears throat> some some historians say that he he threw them at the golden calf um and then he took this golden calf and he burned it and he ground it to powder put it in the water and made the people drink it so this this was he was basically making them understand how you know how how foolish they were and to basically drink their sin <clears throat> So after um, this happened and things, you know, calmed down, so Moses went back up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments a second time. The second time, God did not write the, uh, the, the commandments on the tablets, but he spoke the commandments and Moses was the one who wrote them on the tablets. After this event, then the Lord spoke to Moses and he told them, he told him to uh, build a tabernacle, <clears throat> to build a tabernacle. This tabernacle is a sanctuary, a place for the people to worship. And it was set in the, mid in the midst of the camp, as you see here in the picture. So these are all the tents of the, of the Israelites, three tribes on every side, there's 12 tribes. So three tribes here, three here, three here, three here. And the Lord is in the midst of them because the idea is that the Lord is among us. God is among us. Um, and they, they put or they built the Ark of the Covenant. And this is the most important article in the tabernacle. And they put the two tablets that Moses received from God um, in the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so this was serving as a place of worship um, until they entered into Canaan and later on, uh, after the, 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 the time of David, his son, Solomon, he built the temple, which is known as the Temple of Solomon, on the same design as the tabernacle. But because they, they were wandering in the wilderness, so they needed a portable uh, sanctuary that they can wrap up and carry whenever they moved. <clears throat> you see here, there's a pillar of cloud that descended from heaven onto the tabernacle. This front part of the tabernacle is the Holy of Holies. And this is where the presence of God was, uh, was, was displayed or known. And so in the, more, in the daytime, it was a pillar of cloud and at, at night, it was a pillar of fire. And so from anywhere in the camp, no matter where you are, you can always look and you can be comforted that God is there because in the daytime you see the pillar of cloud and at night you see a pillar of fire. As long as the pillar of clouds or the pillar of fire remained on top of the tabernacle, the people did not move. Whenever the pillar was lifted up, then they knew it was time to move and then they started to gather their stuff and they, 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 uh, they traveled. As they marched in the wilderness, so whenever the pillar was taken up, they would, they would start to march. Um, they would disassemble the tabernacle and they would start carrying it. As you see in the picture here, uh, the, the Ark of Covenant um, had two poles that they would put, it, had, it has rings as you see here. And, um, Within these rings, they would put the poles, and then uh, the Levites, who are the priests, they would carry um, the the Ark of Covenant. And this this was the same for all the articles. So the altar of incense had rings and had poles. Um, the um, altar of sacrifices, the table of showbread, all of these articles were designed the same way. And the idea is nobody touches them. Nobody like as you see here. They are carrying them from the poles and nobody dares to touch, especially the Ark of the Covenant. Um, as we read in Exodus 40, whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey until the day that it was taken up. So this is the, the design of the tabernacle. We spoke about the tabernacle before in much more detail, um, but we will just mention here 
So the tabernacle can be broken into three sections and everything in the tabernacle is threes. So we have um, the outer court, and then we have the holy or the holy place, and then we have the holy of holies. In the outer court, we have three items. We have the gate, this is the entrance, and then we have the bronze laver or the, uh, sorry, the bronze altar or the altar of sacrifices. And then behind that, we have the bronze laver. We enter into the holy place. We find three articles as well. We find the golden candlestick or the golden lampstand. We find the golden altar of incense and we find the table of showbread. And then when, when we step through the veil into the holy of holies, we find three things. We find the Ark of the Covenant and the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, which is known as the mercy seat, and also the censer of gold. So everything is in three. Inside the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, there, was, there were also three items. It had the two uh, uh, tablets. It had the rod of Aaron, and it had um, the, uh, the, uh, the can of manna, or the... Uh, the container of, uh, of, of manna. So this was the tabernacle. Every, every one of these items has, of course, symbolism. Um, and as I said, we've covered this before. If you did not uh, attend this, you can find this in, in one of the recordings on the um, Classrooms YouTube page. As they continued to wander in the wilderness um, from Sinai, God led the Israelites through the great and terrible wilderness to Kadesh, the, which is the border of the promised land. The children of Israel um, toured or, or marched through the wilderness for 40 years, 40 years. So I told you last time, the life of Moses can also be broken in three sets of 40s. So 40 years he was in Egypt, 40 years he was a shepherd in the wilderness, and then 40 years he led the Israelites from Egypt to the promised land. When they got close to Canaan, so Moses sent spies to go and, and bring back a report about this land because they, they, they need to conquer the land, so they need to see what this land looks like. And so he, he sent 12, uh, 12 spies one from each of the, tri the 12 tribes of Israel. The majority of the spies came back. There were 10, uh, 10 out of the 12, and they spoke against the invasion of the land because of the huge inhabitants of Canaan. So they brought back a very negative report, and they said, the people are like giants, and we were like ants in their eyes, and we better not go in there because they're going to kill us. And they made the, the, all the people fear and afraid. Two of the spies, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephanna, they brought back a positive report. And they said the land is, is, is wonderful. And they brought back some of the fruit of the land. So as you see here, this is a cluster of grape. And it was carried by two men. So you can imagine how how the how giant this this uh, vine was that they only took one cluster and had had to be carried by two men and you also see some of the giant fruits like uh, maybe this is pomegranate or something um, and so they said the land is blessed and we should go and um, you know uh, uh, go and and uh, take it because the Lord has given this land to us. So only two out of the 12 brought back a good report. When the 10 who brought back the negative report started to talk, the people started to rebel and they refused to march forward. And they started to rebel against Moses and started to look for a new leader who would take them back to Egypt, the land of slavery. So like they, they, they lost hope, they, they became uh, depressed, and they said, let's just go back to what we know, we'll be slaves again, but at least we'll, we'll live, and let's not dare to enter into Canaan. God was very angry, 
and he punished them um, by by sending sending um, uh, serpents among them, as you see in the image here. And so these serpents would bite the people and uh, inflict them. But the Lord, still in His mercy, He He told Moses to erect a bronze serpent, as you see here, on a pole, and if anyone just all he has to do is he has to look at this bronze serpent, he would be healed from his wound. This bronze ser serpent represents the cross and it represents Christ who was crucified on the cross. The serpents represent, of course, sin and the devil. So anyone who is afflicted by the devil all he has to do is reach out to the Lord Jesus Christ who's crucified on the cross and he would heal him from his wounds. This kind of rebellion happened multiple times. It didn't just happen one time. So they complained about everything. They complained when they didn't have food. They, they complained when they didn't have water. They complained when they had manna and no meat. Um, so this, this complaining and re rebellion was a recurring thing. And so God condemned that the entire generation who left Egypt, not a single one of them would enter the promised land, except for two people, the two spies who brought back a good report, and that was Joshua and Caleb. And this is why the Lord uh, made them basically get lost in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, to basically um, remove that entire, um, uh, you know, faithless generation, uh, and none of them would enter into his uh, promised land. So you, we see here the route from the Exodus. Um, this is Egypt. Ramses is, is where, um, close to Goshen. They lived in Goshen. So they, they went down. And this is where the, they crossed the Red Sea. This is the, the narrowest um, um, section of the, of the Red Sea. So they crossed here. And then this is their destination, Canaan here. So it would make sense for them to just cross like this. And if they, if they made the journey crossing like this, they would, they would have been there in probably 40 days. But instead, the Lord led them on this very long journey. Here's Mount Sinai. This is where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Um, and, and even, so we could say, okay, maybe um, we can understand that they needed to go back to Mount Sinai where, where the Lord appeared to Moses. Um, but then they should have just gone straight to Canaan. But no, they go into the wilderness and they, and they go in circles. You see this loop here. They keep going in circles until that entire congregation is dead that came out of Egypt. And then they finally start to march towards Canaan. By this time, the old generation has died and the new generation are being taught correctly the oracles of God by Moses and Aaron and Joshua. So it is a more faithful generation. During their years of wandering, um, as I said, they complained about everything. And e even though Moses was a very patient man, um, his patience was being tested by the murmuring and the grumbling and the complaints of the people. Um, one, the, they complained about not having water twice. The first time um, the Lord told Moses, go to the rock and strike the rock with your rod and it will give them water. And so Moses went and he struck the rod, the, 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 the rock with his rod and water gushed out and the people drank. This was the first uh, incident, incident of this. The second time this happened, the people again complained that they did not have any water. And this time, the Lord told Moses, go to the rock and, and speak to the rock. 
and water would, would flow to the people. By this time, Moses was angry and upset and his patients were, were afraid from the complaints of the people. And so he, he took the people and he went to the rock. And instead of speaking to the rock, he relied on what he did last time that worked. And so in anger, he told them, well, this, you know, you, you, you very faithless people, will this rock bring you forth water? And he struck the rock and nothing happened. And so, and so he struck the rock a second time and then water flowed. Um, because of this incident, Moses was not permitted to enter the promised land. Why? Let's, un let's understand here. What was the, the error of Moses? The rock represents the Lord Christ. And water coming out from the rock, this represents life out of death. It's a rock. It's, it's a dead um, uh, substance. It doesn't have any life. But when, when he struck it with the, uh, with the rod, life came out of it, water. So the first time when the Lord told Moses to strike the rock, if we understand that the rock is Christ, then the rod is the cross. And so when he struck it the first time, this was the crucifixion, meaning that through the crucifixion, water would come or life would come to the people. He also took with him the elders and they represented the chief priests and this represented the trial that the Lord Jesus Christ endured before he was crucified. So this was all the first time. The second time, when he told him, speak to the rock, again, the rock is Christ. When we speak to God, what is this called? This is called prayers. And what gives us life when we pray? This is the Eucharist. Moses here disobeyed the command of the Lord to speak to the rock. And perhaps he, he did not believe that just speaking to the rock would bring forth water. And of course, as we said, he was angry and he was furious. And so by doing this, by hitting the rock, he did not hallow God. He did not sanctify the Lord in front of the people. And in his anger, he, um, he also confused the prophecies because the Lord was not crucified twice. He was only crucified once. Um, Moses represents the Old Testament. And so Moses did not enter the promised land or he did not bring the people into the promised land because the Old Testament laws cannot bring salvation. The Old Testament laws cannot bring salvation. Who brought the people into the promised land? His disciple Joshua. Joshua, by the way, the name Joshua and Jesus is the same name. And so Joshua is a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the one who brought the people in and he is the savior or he represents the savior. So salvation comes from the New Testament, not from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, I told you this before, but the last word in the Old Testament in the, in the book of Malachi is curse. So no matter what you, you do, if you follow all the laws and all the prophecies and all of the sacrifices and all of the rites in the Old Testament, the best it can bring you to is curse. It cannot bring you life. But the New Testament starts with the book of life. The New Testament is life because the Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate in the, in the New Testament and he gave us um, life in the, in the New Testament. The death of Moses, we read this in Deuteronomy chapter 34. We, we read that Moses went up to the plain, from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. So Jericho would be the first city across the Jordan, which the people would uh, inherit once they crossed the Jordan. And that's the first place that Joshua took the people. So he was at the edge of the promised land. 
And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, meaning all the land that the people would inherit from the south to the north. Dan was all the way in the north. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So the Lord, still out of his um, uh, mercy, he allowed Moses to see the promised land, even though he did not permit him to enter the promised land. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, he being the Lord, it's capital H, and he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. So the Lord took Moses up on top of the mountain. He showed him the, 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 the land that they will be inheriting. But then he told him, you are not going to cross. And so Moses died there on the mountain. And the Lord himself buried him. And nobody knows his burial place until today. Why is that? We read in the, in the epistle of St. Jude in the New Testament. We read that... Um, Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed over the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. What is, what is the story? And why did the Lord bury the, and hide the body of Moses? Moses was a great prophet among the people, the greatest prophet. They followed him for 40 years. He um, uh, freed them from slavery in Egypt. He split, split the Red Sea for them. He showed them many, many signs and many miracles. He's, he is as close to God, to the people, as they will ever get. If the people knew where the body of Moses was, it is very, very reasonable that they would have unburied him. They would have taken the body of Moses probably mummified him like the Egyptians uh, mummified their dead uh, um, and worshipped him as a god. And it, it would have been a very, very strong faith in somebody who was their father and literally their god with a lowercase g for 40 years. And so the devil knew this, obviously. And so he tried to uncover the body of Moses, or he tried to maybe um, allow people to figure out where it was. And so Michael, the archangel, went and fought against the devil to stop him from doing that, so that the people do not fall into this idolatry. Did Moses ever enter the promised land? Yes, he did, and during the transfiguration. We read in Matthew 17, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. So even though the Lord um, did not allow Moses to enter the promised land with the people thousands of years ago, when the Lord transfigured on the mountain, he allowed Moses to actually enter finally the promised land and not just to enter with, with, with the rebellious people, but to enter with who? With the Lord himself. And, and this, is, this is a good lesson for, for us all in that um, sometimes, you know, we, we say that every, every prayer is answered. Sometimes the answer is no. Many times the answer is wait. Many times the answer is wait. And a lot of people don't like that answer. Wait, no, I want something now. I want something now. I don't want to wait. If Moses had said, no, Lord, I really want to enter. Please let me enter. I've done all of this work, and now you're not letting me enter. Just let me enter. Just let me set foot inside of the land, and then after that, um, I can die. He would have entered with the people and, and probably continued to hear about their complaints and everything like that. But Moses accepted that the answer to your prayer is wait. And so he accepted, okay, Lord, 
you don't want me to enter, you have wisdom in that, I will not enter. Because the answer to the prayer is wait a few thousand years and then enter with me. So if, if you were Moses, which would you choose? Would you choose to enter now because you want to enter and you, you think you deserve it and you've done all this work? Or would you choose to wait and then enter with the Lord? Of course, you would, you would wait and enter with the Lord. So the idea is um, don't get upset when the Lord doesn't answer you quickly because the answer may be, wait, I have something better for you in the future. So we will stop here with the, um, with the death of Moses. And as I said, when we continue um, the course um, after the summer in August, we will pick up from Joshua and, and continue our journey with the history of the Old Testament. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let me start the Kahoot here. <clears throat>